I remember a bunch of us hanging out. He's funny as fuck, right? So he's making jokes, and he and we could all be sitting together just like this, and he would get up and just leave. And you're like, what the fuck? And he he explained that. He's like, I think in music, when you're sitting and you have words going in your head or thinking about lunch or thoughts, he's like, my head, I hear music. And there are times I have to, like, he just leaves because there's some melody, there's something, and I got to go put it down. When he says, I think in music, that gave me an insight into the fashion was coming from the music, meaning he looked like he sounded. His presentation was an, as equal a visual representation of his sound as he could get. And every time his music changed, his look changed. So to track Prince's fashion is to track his music. Who was Prince? That is what I wish reporters were asking. And everything he touched was brilliant. He was the best pimp I've ever seen. His hair was blackity black, 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 black all the time and almost like black girl black. His measurements were the same as my daughter's and my daughter was 10. Being in the band is like the musical equivalent of being in the fire department. You had to be ready at a moment's notice. He called me, he's like, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, oh, I'm free. He's like, okay, come to Panama. What are you doing in Florida? He's like, no, I'm in Panama, come to Panama. Welcome to chapter six of Who Was Prince? Chapter six, you could burn up my clothes because we're gonna talk about Prince's clothes and his photographers and his sense of aesthetics and vibe and the in-house tailors and shutterbugs who made him look great. Because if we're being real in a door, when Prince says you could burn up my clothes, smash up my ride, well, maybe not the ride. Yeah, he's lying. His clothes meant way more to him than his rides. Prince's cars were cool. But his clothes were custom. They were an extension of him. I'm your host, Torre, and Prince... He activated clothes. That's Michaela Angela Davis. It's like, if you watch Prince walk, he turns the clothes into an event. Michaela is a fashion world veteran who's worked as a stylist for Oprah, Beyonce, Diana Ross, LL Cool J, and Prince. Her time with Prince started in the late 90s after a brief meeting. I went to... Paisley Park, and I think we hung out for maybe five minutes, but it was magical. He's got a, a frequency, and I just, I think, happened to tap into his frequency at a particular time. It makes perfect sense that Prince hired Michaela because she is a force of nature. I've known her forever, and she's always overflowing with energy and light and creativity and positivity and great ideas about fashion and style and the brilliance of blackness. But before they could get into the work, she had to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. When I took his measurements and I had to sign an NDA to not disclose because they were so tiny. What I can say is at the time, his measurements were the same as my daughter's and my daughter was 10. He was one step away from being like a little person, but his proportions were perfect. His body was a great canvas for fashion. He was man-child. He was woman-man. He embodied, like, all of it. He looked like a man. He looked like a child. He looked like a woman. He looked like he was black. He looked like he was white. He looked like he was Middle Eastern. He looked like he was 40. He looked like he was 14. Like, all at one time. And as you can tell from his looks, Prince got very passionate about clothes. Jerome said Prince would look at an outfit and go nuts. Uh, this is going to be clean. I'm going to get you this. You're going to have this gold lame hanging here. And this is, and you're going to wear a tie. Ooh, you know, he, he, he got really excited about his attire. He really did. I mean, those were one of the moments that he was vulnerable <laughs> with his clothes because he, he was really excited about the stuff. You would go to wherever he was at, whatever warehouse he had, and he would say, come, come see this. And he would lay the stuff out and just start dancing around and stomping and, and be excited. And then, you know, you hook up with him to go out to the club or meet him at the club that night. And as soon as you catch his eye, he'd he get your eye attention. You, you, you look in man's eyes, he'd go into a stroll. He was performing. He was performing. He loved, he loved the presence 
of being a star. His looks changed immensely over time, but they always seemed to fit his princely persona. Where other performers changed constantly in ways that suggested conscious attempts at change with some Madonna, Prince seemed to grow organically from album to album, his looks flowing out of wherever he was musically. It didn't seem like he was changing based on a strategy. It seemed like his clothes were an extension of his creativity. His 1979 sophomore album called Prince, with Why You Want to Treat Me So Bad and I Feel For You, gave us a cover where Prince was shirtless with his hair in a long perm. His hair alone. Because it looked like that James Brown kind of, I started out with a perm and I danced so hard and sweated out into this Afro perm thing, right? The purity of his face, there was no fashion, but that was such a black ass cover. Like because of how the texture of his hair signaled to us that this is a guy that is rooted in blackness. Okay, yeah, before we really go into the clothes, let's go into the hair. Because the prince's clothes were a thing, prince's hair was definitely a thing. It's the story of black life. Over the course of his career, he did, like, everything with his hair. He blew it out, he puffed it up, he laid it down, he afroed it. Finger waves, box braids, cornrows, press and curl... Like, he looked like, I mean, I do know that some regular-ass girls that have beauty shops on the block came with their ovens and did his hair. Like, I saw that shit. Like, the same, like, Shaniqua that is over there is pressing and curling Prince's hair. Like, that, I, that's what, I think I love, I think I love his hair more than I love his clothes. Because... His hair never left the street. His clothes were going, like, we were cosmic, we were going everywhere. But there was something about his hair that just stayed extra black. Like, he could have, he could have pulled it back in a ponytail. He could have given you a top knot. He could have, you know, tried to be ambiguous about his hair. His hair was blackity black, 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 black all the time. And almost like black girl black. And I appreciate, I... I have more appreciation for that now than ever because I've been kind of looking back at it at his hair journey and he he's like he's like one of us like he explored his hair just like Mary J. Blige did like he just yeah he was one of us he was like one of the girls when it came to his hair I don't think he ever did a weave I never saw him like add extensions I don't think because he was against it I just don't think he did it but I think of, that's maybe the only thing he didn't do. I love how he pre- he pressed and curled his hair a lot. But in the end, he came back to an afro. I love because to me, the afro is the it's the halo. Okay, had to get that out. Now back to the clothes. In the beginning, Prince's music was stripped down and poppy, and so was his look. But a couple of years later, as he got into Dirty Mind and Controversy and a more new wave meets funk sound that was more edgy, his look grew more sexually aggressive. Now he was in trench coats, women's underwear, leg warmers, and high heels. It looked like he'd raided his girlfriend's closet, but could still wear her things with a masculine flair. It fits someone who was singing about himself as a controversial figure, who was singing songs about giving head and getting deflowered by his older sister. It was shocking to many people to see a man on stage in women's clothes, but the album was named Controversy. A few years later, he's doing a virtual rock opera with Purple Rain, so he's wearing rock royalty jackets of shiny purple with lots of buttons and lace and ruffles and pizzazz. It suggested royalty at a moment when his music was epic and he was ascending to the global elite and it was a look so precise and beloved, fans could copy it. Now you could show up to a concert looking like Prince, which made him seem even larger. That was the moment I think that him and his whole crew literally started to affect fashion. That's when people really started to dress like Prince. In the years after that, He started wearing more crop tops and showing off his stomach. He's a dude that's wearing crop tops. And crop top, like, so I think I had a whole, I remember having a whole, like, dissertation kind of conversation about that. Because that really was 
only women wore crop tops, really. I mean, the gay boys did, but it was very kind of, you know, in the club. The fact that he was playing with the body parts and the silhouettes that were almost exclusively for women was... I mean, this is so ahead of the time. There was, we didn't even have a language called like fluidity and gender fluid, like, you know, non-conforming. He went for bold colors or polka dots because his music was bold. He didn't want to be subtle. He didn't want to be minimalist. He wasn't trying to be, uh, you know, cool and blend in. He was trying to be alive. Like, if you listen to his music, nothing in there is beige or brown. He loved high-waisted pants that emphasized the voluptuous, almost feminine curve of his hips. Prince turned it around. Like, he's like, you're going to look at the curve of my, right before my ass. And that's the part that a lot of men fetishize around women. Like, that's where you put your tattoo, that's the, the, the. And he's like, I got that too. Like, that's, yeah. And the fact that he kind of reveled in it was he was modeling for us what nonconformity looks like. You would never catch Prince in casual clothes, not even at home. He'd wear some gorgeous tailored pajamas when he was padding around the house. You would never, ever see him in blue jeans. Casual was out for him. And he spread that rule to everyone in his orbit. Gail Chapman, the revolution's first keyboardist, told me it was the law for the whole band that every time they left their hotel room for any reason, they had to be fully dressed like they were about to go on stage. Jerome talked about having that same ethos. The attitude of cool, we were required to have that at all times. Even when we're dealing with our friends, part of it is, you know, Moore said, you never see me in no blue jeans. You, you better not bring no blue jeans out on the road. If I think your clothes get clean, I better not find no blue jeans. I'm telling. <laughs> in her memoir, The Most Beautiful, Maite says Prince often stole her clothes, her tops, her pants. If she bought a suit, he'd nab it and put in shoulder pads. She also says his walk-in closet was a wonderland and that all his clothes were organized by color, beginning with black, then brown, red, and an amazing array of purple, indigo, and blue, coordinating shoes lined up on the floor below. Speaking of shoes, at the core of the nonconformist prince, who somehow borrowed heavily from femininity while remaining masculine, was his penchant for wearing high heels. Prince was known for wearing heels from early on. Three to four inch heels were a constant throughout his career. And they seemed an ode to James Brown, the soul funk god who rocked heels, as well as a shout out to all the ladies in the house. Prince always said he wore them because women loved them. It gave him three inches no matter what. But also the way that you dance in heels is different and it makes your body do different things. It's almost like tango shoes. So I think part of it was... A, just give him the height, but also it gave him the shape that he needed, the silhouette, because it does lift your butt. Like, that's what a heel does. Prince never bought clothes. He had them made. There was a group of designers and tailors working exclusively for him, designing and making custom looks. Full time. Like, they are making, because his daily clothes are all, everything's custom made because they have to be tailored to his size and the and his pants Almost invariably, there were shoes that were made of the same fabric. So it looked like this continuous line so that it gave the illusion that he was taller. So everything he wore had to have an illusion. Because Prince had his own tailors and never wore anything but custom-made clothes, he didn't need a stylist like Michaela to come in and pull clothes from famous designers the way stylists usually do. No, she was there to conceptualize the look that the tailors would make. Like, we're going to work from an idea or an era or some, you know, inspiration, some artistic inspiration, and then find the clothes to support that. This was almost more like making a film. Her sartorial consultations with Prince were high concept conversations that helped change the direction of his fashion sense. He was preparing to do Rave Unto the Joy Fantastic and moving toward a new look. And Michaela was there to give him a vision. My concept for him was that we would go very, like, North African. 
She started by presenting him with a mood board that told a story about Egypt and the symbolism around it and magical carpet rides. What was on her mood board? Photos of like 1950s caravans, photos of 1970s Vogue, when that look was very much in style, the like vintage caftans. I showed him photos of, you know, just ancient Egyptian iconography. Um, but I put it together almost like it was a pitch for a film. Like, here's the inspiration. And he got it, and he was excited by it. Oh, this was the other thing. You know, he was vegan, and he didn't want anything leather or anything that came from animals. So I also had to consider that. Like, there's this, you know, beautiful Egyptian cotton, and so we talked about cotton and the history of cotton, and it became a whole thing once I sat with him. I showed him time and space But I thought he could also start to adorn himself more, like more jewelry. And so, you know, I dug in the book Africa Adorned and just showed him these like fantastic photos and how he could wear cornrows with, you know, um, beads in them that are gold. Like we were going there, like we were going, we were about to get really Tuareg and, you know, African. She felt that he was getting older and becoming an elder statesman and was ready for a look that represented that he was somehow higher. I felt him to be getting into this almost um, priest-like space and and his symbolism. I was like, this is very kind of Egyptian, North African. And I also knew that there are beautiful uh, caftans and robes that I could get that were made for boys or women that we could then tailor to him. And that he was just in that like, you know, my feet don't touch the ground space. Because, you know, there was no more, you know, butts out and slip and, you know, doing that thing. He was elevated. So that was kind of my pitch to him. Like, I'll go to Morocco and shop. And, and he was into, like, he was like, yes, yes. Um, because he he really got the vibe. You can't go to Prince and talk about trends or this designer's doing He don't give a fuck. Like, what's the, what's the, what's the juice like what's the spirit what's the where where are you coming from you know cosmically and then how does that cosmic thing you know turn into a garment Michaela was just one of several people who were advising Prince on looks she said one of the central people on his fashion team was a designer and fashion illustrator from Chicago named Debbie McGowan I love her story she was like a super fan I love Prince beyond, but there are people who love artists and almost not like beyond a cult-like way, like a spiritual... At first, Debbie loved Prince from afar and was constantly drawing sketches of him in all sorts of outfits that she dreamt up for him. For as long as Michaela knew her, Debbie only sketched Prince. She loved him. Michaela came to know Debbie in the 80s, when both Debbie and Michaela's sister were living in Paris. At the time, she was a a background vocalist, and she was singing with all these big people, and she had this great apartment, and, you know, people would come and, like, have dinner. All the, you know, black American girls would come, and men, and, like, Patrick Kelly. Like, it was very few, you know, just American black folks in Paris in the 80s. And it was a scene. It was a fabulous scene. And Debbie was adopted into that group. And she would just draw prints all the time. Like her whole sketchbook of designs were all prints. As the story goes, someone in that little scene, maybe one of the background vocalists, got some of Debbie's sketches to prints. Because everybody knew she was obsessed with, like, we're like, girl, like what? All she did was draw prints. And he loved them. And like a week later, she was at Paisley Park and she was there for ever. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. There is a woman who went the distance, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I'm Katy Perry. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth the First. Elizabeth I, the podcast, wherever you listen. 
Talk about living the dream. Debbie arrived in Minneapolis in 1993 and stayed in Prince's employ for 14 years. Many of the things he wore in that period came from her imagination. I mean, a lot of what you saw him wearing, she was dreaming, like literally dreaming and drawing. And I, they feel like they were communicating on this other level. Of course, they shared a vibe, a deep mind meld that allowed their partnership to flourish. Like I knew people knew him and loved him. Everybody had like, everybody had print stories, right? Including me, but, but I was like, Debbie was connected with him spiritually. And so, and maybe that could have wore, you know, could have worn her out. It's a lot being devoted, you know, and that's really what it was. It, she was like a devotee. Prince had lots of ways of inspiring her without straight telling her what to do. At times, he would send her a song and say, tell me what designs you think this inspires or what looks would go with it. Sometimes he'd send her magazine tear sheets. She would turn those bits of ideas into drawings that the tailors would turn into clothes. Prince never did fittings, but the tailors had one client, so they knew how to make it work. There were other in-house designers besides Debbie, but it seems like Debbie had a special connection with him. I tried very hard to find her for this show, but no one knew where she was. She was not one to go around talking all the time about having worked with Prince. She was very shy. She certainly wasn't like, you know, celebrity stylist. You know, now so many people promote who they're working with. She was part, she was just, she just was like serving him. She was just so grateful that she had made her dream. That was her only dream. And there it was. Part of why Debbie was a core employee in Prince's world for so long is because she understood what he wanted without him having to tell her. They had a sort of mental connection. With everyone who entered his orbit, Prince looked for that sort of almost telepathic communication. There's what I like to call a wavelength. Greg Boyer was a trombonist with Prince for a decade. There's something that you can't really put your hands on, but you can feel it. It's like trying to describe funk. You can't say it's this and that. You just know what it is when you hear it. He would create a very strong wave, and it was easy to latch on to because he just made the vibe, very definite. If you failed to grasp onto that, it was very obvious that you weren't with everyone else. All he had to do was just give you a look, and you had to figure out what it was, but it didn't take long to figure out that when he gave you a look, you knew exactly what to do. You know, play a solo, come up with a horn line, change key. It didn't take a lot of words because he just made his intentions very clear. He just looked. I mean, you just kind of knew from whatever situation you were in, after playing with him a little bit, you understood that when he gave you a look, he just automatically knew what to do. He wouldn't ask you to be in the band if he didn't think that you had that kind of ability to uh, communicate back and forth with him. Prince looked for that ability to vibe from everyone on his team. I felt like that's how I maintained, you know, doing so many projects with him over time. Steve Park was Prince's art director and photographer for many years. He created the album cover for Graffiti Bridge. I sort of got into his headspace and could say, I'm thinking this will work for him. It wasn't a whole lot of communication. It was more in the moment, feeling what he wanted, um, him definitely signaling through his body language and his movement where he was going with it. And then you start to follow that flow. Once you got in that flow, you had to always be on your toes. Prince was all about spontaneity. If you were a singer or a musician or an engineer, you'd never know when he'd call and say, hey, let's go to the studio and record a song. And you might be like, dude, it's 3 a.m. And he'd be like, see you there. Trombonist Greg Boyer said, being in the band is like the musical equivalent of being in the fire department. <laughs> and in the respect of, you had to be ready to really, really play at a moment's notice. He'd wake you up out of your sleep in the middle of the night and say, hey, we're going to do a, a recording session or we're going to play at some club doing an after party. 
be downstairs dressed and ready. And he's probably the only person I ever played for where his sleep wasn't guaranteed. It was the same thing for the photographers he had on retainer. They never knew when a photo shoot would break out. I was driving down the street. Photographer Randy St. Nicholas recently published a big, gorgeous photo book called My Name is Prince. It's a pretty awesome documentation of her many years shooting prints. It was like 9.30 in the morning, and I looked over at a stoplight, and I saw this building that had smoke wafting off the roof, and I thought, oh, that must have just been on fire. And suddenly, I just turned down the street, got out of my car, walked into the building, because there was this little opening, and the whole thing had just been on fire, and it was all charred, and my phone rang, and it was Prince, and he goes, what are you doing? (laughs) And I go, I'm, um, well... I saw this building that I think must have been on fire in the wee hours of the night, and I just walked in because it's so amazing, and I, I think it'd be great to shoot you here with a baby grand piano. And he goes, where is it? And I told him the address, and he goes, okay, call Studio Instrument Rentals, get a piano over there, and I'll meet you there in an hour. And so I hustled to get my assistants, my gear, the piano. I got a model down there just for entertainment for him, And he showed up, and we did this amazing photo shoot. And then I went back the next night, because I thought it'd be great to shoot it. It was a full moon. I thought to go with that story would be a great picture of shooting just the location by itself, lit with moonlight. And the building was completely locked up, completely boarded up. And it was sort of like a, a metaphor for how Prince lived his life, because if you could be spontaneous in the moment and hang with him no matter what. You were in, you got to capture him, and you were part of this whole incredible journey. You know, if I didn't do it at that moment, that picture would have never happened, that moment would have never happened because the whole building was just boarded up and torn down like a few days later and it was now or never kind of thing. And that's something that's important for, I think, people to understand about Prince's music. He never belabored anything. He was really spontaneous. So he'd go in the studio every day, write music, write lyrics, record it, and move on. He forced you to think on your feet and always give your all. Never let your fear or frustration stop you. It was kind of just this incredible time capsule of creative energy happening pretty much 24 hours a day. We didn't sleep or eat. It was kind of an amazing experience. (laughs) Prince was all about first thought, best thought. If he had a thought, he didn't think twice or doubt himself. He just laid it down and moved on. When songs came to mind, he recorded them right away, usually on the same day. But once they were down, he wasn't married to them. Later on, he'd listen back and quickly decide to throw it into the vault, which could mean never being heard ever again. They say he made about a song a day, so even though he put out a lot of music, he edited out a lot too. Prince didn't spend time looking back, he just kept on plowing ahead. Randy St. Nicholas said his intense focus on the present made her think of a Zen master. People who are incredibly religious and Zen and Zen masters strive to live in the moment, to really just be present, to forget the past, not think about the future, and experience what, what's happening now. This guy literally was born to do that. He really was able to just be present in that moment. So to be able to work with him, you had to be fluid and able to move quickly. I spoke to several of Prince's photographers, and all of them said he was all about executing photo shoots so rapidly, you barely had time to think. They were often spur of the moment and many times didn't last very long. Prince wasn't one to pre-plan or come up with a mood board or even talk much about a vision. He usually preferred to just sort of jump in and see what happened. So there's no time to really think about him, how funny he is, what he's going to do next, or what you're going to do. You're just sort of in that moment. That's Randy St. Nicholas. So you didn't have a lot of time to think about what you were going to do or create. I would be thinking about it constantly so that I could be ahead of the game. But with him, you could never be ahead of the game. He was always ahead of you, wherever you were, no matter how much you were giving your all, this guy was on his own path. So you were constantly hoping to just 
keep up with them if you could. Prince usually raced through his photo shoots. And we didn't have to take a lot of pictures. That's photographer Afshin Shahidi. His photo book is called Prince, A Private View. Unlike commercial jobs where, where I'm taking, you know, 200 images for them to choose one to print, I would take like five, five images he would look at and say, okay, got it. He knew what he wanted. Randy saw the same speed. I really don't think he sat around belaboring over photographs of himself. Because once we started shooting digitally, he'd just go over the monitor and go, okay, this one, this one, and this one. Okay, that's great. Got it. And then he would leave. You know, so he really, and it's, I think it's a similar approach to how he did everything in his life. He went with what his gut told him. He was a really spontaneous guy. He was not premeditated in any way. So unpremeditated that you never knew when you'd be shooting with him or what you'd be shooting for. Steve Park's photo book is called Picturing Prince, an Intimate Portrait. Things were never really planned. I can't remember a time he said, hey, we're going to do a photo for this album cover. It was more like we just shot kind of whenever, and then turned around and he'd say, I, you know, I want this to be the album cover, you know, that type of thing. Um, so it, it was not like you'd think where you would sort of have a concept and be, you know, like, let's let's do this uh, photo shoot specifically geared here. We, we just shoot a lot, you know, um, and it was always, you know, hey, grab your camera, let's do something. It's one thing to be spontaneous with a photo shoot when it's one subject and one photographer or when it's like one performer in a music studio laying down music. But Prince was equally spontaneous when he was making movies. The man loved to make movies. He made several that were never released. One early film started during the controversy tour years before he filmed Purple Rain was called The Second Coming. It was about a young performer returning to play a big show in his hometown, but that whole second coming title and theme surely triggered the Jesus complex thing that he played with a lot on the Purple Rain album. The man loved to make movies, and surely a movie can't be made with spontaneity, right? Movies cost a lot of money, they require a lot of people and time, but even when making movies, Prince went about things in a speedy way. Afshin Shahidi worked with him on a later film, called 3121. It was a film that did not have a script. Oftentimes I would walk in and he'd say, okay, I just want to film here. And I said, what's happening? He's like, just get the space ready and we'll film and you'll see. (laughs) And I flew all the way down there only to find out he wanted to film down there. So then I had to leave and and, and go to Miami to pick up equipment. And so I was producing at the same time as shooting, at the same time as as directing portions of it. Um, But we made a feature length film Um, that I never read the script for, but it was all in his head. (laughs) And, and, you know, and we would drive around. There was was some scenes which I, you know, for me, it was fantastic. We're driving around Panama City, Panama, in the old town in a van, and I have, you know, a couple million dollars worth of 35-millimeter film equipment. And we stop somewhere that inspires Prince, and he hops out, and we hop out with him, and we're filming on the streets of Panama. And how that related to the story, I, I still couldn't tell you. I've seen, uh, I've seen a couple cuts of the uh, of the film. I don't know if that will ever see the light of day, but um, you know, it was quite the experience making it with him. This is a film that was shot on location in Panama and Morocco and Los Angeles and Minneapolis, based on a plot that lived only in Prince's mind. But Prince also gave the photographers around him a lot of freedom to come up with their own ideas. Afshin Shahidi said he felt empowered by Prince's silence. The other part, which was both scary and amazing, was he gave me a lot of leeway. So a lot of the shoots that we did, he might tell me, oh, hey, I want to do this for, for a tour book. But that was it. He's like, come up, come up with some ideas. Come up with something yourself that you think is unique. And so... You know, I would be petrified, I'd be mortified, like, okay, what am I going to come up with that, that Prince is going to like? But he gave me that freedom, and, and that was pretty uh, spectacular for, for a creative person. Of course, Prince did sometimes suggest inspirations. He once asked Afshin Shahidi to create lighting that was reminiscent of what he had seen in paintings by Rembrandt. In terms of Rembrandt, it really was in reference to uh, the way that the lighting looked in, in the Rembrandt paintings. And I remember, I wish I could tell you which painting, but I remember he pulled one up on his phone. He said, look at, look at the way that this, that this light just falls so beautifully, you know, across the subject and the background, and it accentuates, you know, and takes your eye to where Rembrandt wanted you to look. And again, that, you know, 
asking me to, to make a Rembrandt with a photograph was a big challenge, and, and I was up for trying. I don't know if I ever achieved it, but, but he would give me those types of challenges to see um, you know, what would become of them. He would reference past masters. He would reference other photographs, but purely as a reference. He never wanted to recreate or redo anything. He would give it to me as inspiration. I remember he gave me a book uh, on, it was called Hollywood Love, and I wish I had it still because he had gone through and marked each of the images that kind of spoke to him, and it was old Hollywood kind of glamour shots type of thing. It's telling that the Rembrandt reference was ultimately about lighting because Prince knew the power of lighting and often spoke up about his lighting. He would walk into a room occasionally when we were filming things, and he'd point at lights and he'd say, turn that light off and turn that light off. You know, and we turn it off and it would become better. It would become moodier and sexier and, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. This man knows. So he backed up that control with actual knowledge and, and ability. Um, but I think like uh, people have pointed out there, there must have been, and I don't know what that incident is or, or, or the things in his childhood that made him feel out of control that then, you know, pushed him in adult life to seek that control. Because um, I got to imagine that it's also really tiring to have to look over and view and, you know, be in control of everything in, in the way that he was. Prince was clear on how he wanted to be seen, like how he wanted to move in photographs. There's a specific set of poses and movements you can expect in a Prince photo. Well, there was always, his, his hands had to be doing something. Like, you rarely, I have one image of Prince with his hands down by his side, and whenever I come across it, it just seems like the oddest image, because I never saw him that way any other time. If you look at most of the images, his hands are doing something, either they're up in front of his face, or they're, they're very expressive. So that was, that was one thing that was pretty consistent, was him finding something cool to do with his hands. And then in terms of angles, I think we would try a lot of different things, but what he typically chose were the ones that highlighted his eyes, because he had a really piercing gaze. And, and the pictures he would tend to go for were the ones where the, you know, his eyes just kind of stood out. He wanted to be seen as, as a, I guess, a strong silent type, and I would always mess with him because we had all these images of the in-between when he was laughing and smiling and, and you know, kind of pulling pranks or telling jokes. But rarely did, did those uh, make the cut in terms of what he wanted to send out. And I put a, a few images in my book that, that show him smiling and goofing around because that was his personality. He, he liked to have fun. Uh, he was not as serious as he comes off in most of the pictures, but the pictures that he would tend to choose, because you, he would laugh at the goofy images and we would keep that for ourselves. We would keep it. He wouldn't say, okay, trash that or delete it. But the ones that he usually wanted me to service or to give to the music club were the more serious images where he looked like, you know, kind of the rock star god that, that, that he was. He always wanted just to, to seem like he was in control. And Prince had all sorts of ways of establishing that he was in control. We end where we started with a story from Michaela Angela Davis. So one day he, we were shooting a video um, and he came to the set with no shoes on and like white knit pants, like very off the boat. And I think he even had like a turban, like half turban, half do-rag, but he didn't have any draws on. Listen, so... The white pant, knit pants. And all the women were like, oh, man, dude, like he was little, but he wasn't little. And I think he did that just to fuck with us. Like I thought it was, I thought like he did that just to fuck with us. Like, let me just walk through the set, fuck y'all up and then go. It was great which delivers us nicely to the seventh chapter of Who Was Prince, where we'll talk about his sexuality. Prince from the perspective of his lovers. What was it like to be his woman? What was it like to be with him? What was it like for him to propose? And why did one of his girlfriend's mothers say, He was the best pimp I've ever seen. In the event there is overexcitement, your seat cushion may be used as a flotation device next time on Who Was Prince.
Thanks for listening to Who Was Prince. Please share with your friends if you like the show. Our executive producers were me, Torre, Chris Colbert, Adele Coleman, and Ryan Woodhull. Our technical producer, Byron Hunt. And our distribution was by DCP Entertainment.